Well, today we continue our series on love where you live. Love where you live. And again, we're looking in John chapter 9, so have your Bibles. Now, I want you for just a moment to think back to a day. A day when you could walk into, say, the Fellowship Hall or the Great Hall, and there would be tables filled with food. There would be maybe children in a corner, and the only mass to be seen would be those children as they played a game. There would be people laughing, and you would enjoy life together. Maybe it was a connect group gathering. Well, those days are going to come back, but do you remember them? And if you were part of a connect group that would gather like that, maybe in a home, maybe here at church, you would want everyone to feel included and get to know one another, and you might play a game. You know, I'm a part of a connect group, and we've played a game one time called Two Truths and a Lie. Have you ever played that? Okay, most of you have it. Now, in Two Truths and a Lie, every individual tells three statements about themselves. Two are factually true. One could be, it's plausible, but it's not. So we're going to play right now. We're going to see how well you know me. I'm going to give you three statements about myself, okay? First of all, I have been skydiving with a connect group leader from Park City's Baptist Church. Now, that'd be pretty cool. Doesn't sound like me, does it? Secondly, I have been fishing with Hank Aaron. Every kid's dream, I've been fishing with Hank Aaron. The last one, my senior pastor broke my arm. All right? You may say, and it was probably justified. Okay, now let's see. We're going to let you vote. If you think, I'm going to change the order up. If you think that I went fishing with Hank Aaron, raise your hand. Well, I did. Okay, I have been fishing with Hank Aaron. My dad was a friend of his. My dad loved to fish. That gene skipped me. I I don't. But he took Hank fishing on a number of occasions, and I got to go. He was the sweetest man, so that one's true. The second one, I have been skydiving with a connect group leader. Raise your hand if you think that one's true. Well, you have more faith in me than I did because that one's not true. It was supposed to be true. For my daughter's 18th birthday, she said, Dad, I want us to do this together. I booked it. Two weeks out, she said, I'm not doing this. I fell to my knees and thanked God for mercy (laughs) as I pulled out that phone and said, we're out. And I've regretted it ever since. I wish that I had done that. So that means that, yes, my pastor broke my arm. How many of you thought that one was true? That one hurts because more of you voted on that one than any any of the others right there. I've worked for five senior pastors. The other four want to find him and high five him. Okay, the reason that we're playing this game is you get drawn in to a story. I want you to know, as you heard the story in a few moments ago on the video bumper, there is power in your story. There's power in your story. Your story is unique to you, and it binds us together. In fact, physiologists have told us that when two people are in an interaction where they're sharing life, that our bodies will actually begin to produce oxytocin, a hormone, and it'll bind us together. There's just something about story that pulls us together. So today we're going to look at the power of your story. And as we go through this blessed series, remember we began several weeks ago with B, begin with prayer. And all of us were encouraged to pray that God might bring people across our lives to intersect our lives that we might pray for that we might get to know, that we might get to serve. The second week was listen. What a grace, what a gift to give others. The power of listening. If you didn't hear that message, you need to go back and need to listen to it. In a day when people want to talk and talk over each other, the power of listening is a grace. Several weeks ago, eat. Now, I enjoyed this one right here. My wife says I'm always two meals ahead, and that's true. I know what I'm having for lunch, and I'm hoping what I'm having for dinner. So eat. But when we eat in the context of blessing others, what we're doing is we're coming around the table. We're putting ourselves in an intimate setting where life can be shared. And so we were encouraged as we come out of this pandemic to find ways to share life, and eat would be a way to do that. Last week, we talked about serve. That as you've gotten to know someone, as you pray for them, there may be some tangible physical ways in which you might could serve them, that you might could help them. Well, this week we come to the power of story. 
The story that we're going to be reading this morning is a very familiar story. If you've been in church for any time, you've probably read this. You've heard Sunday School, Connect Group lessons on it. You may have heard a message. But there's parts of this story today I would imagine you've done as I've done and just grazed over them, kind of skipped over them, and you miss the point of the story unless you look at it very deeply. We're going to be looking at a man's life whose life was changed by Jesus. And as we consider the power of your story, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your life was changed by Jesus. Now our outline today is going to be a very simplistic one. We're going to be looking at our story, your story, this man's story, from the point of my life before Jesus, how I met Jesus, and my life since I came to Jesus. So today we're going to begin with the first point of my life before Jesus. If you like to take notes, and I do, that's your first point. Look with me, John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now let's talk a little bit about the setting of this interaction. They are in Jerusalem. They're walking up a street. We know from the text that it's the Sabbath day, and they begin to hear the cries of a beggar. Now, that would not be unusual in that day. This is a day before a social safety net. And if you were disabled, and unless you were fortunate enough to be born with money or a family with money, your only hope of survival was to get by. And for many of them, if they weren't able to work, that meant begging. So there were cries of beggars across the city. They're walking up the street, They hear the cry of a beggar, and they stop. They stop. I want us to look at how the disciples reacted to this beggar. Now, one of the things that we'll see is this was not just a chance encounter. There had been some sort of interaction in the past because the disciples knew something about him. They knew that he was born blind. Now, on this day, they don't see him as an individual with needs. They see him as an object an object of curiosity, and they look at Jesus and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or this woman that he was born, or his parents, that he was born blind? Now for us, we would cringe at that statement. For the Jew in that day, that was a very logical question to ask because the Jews would would associate sin and suffering. There was a linkage there. So when they saw this man, they said, did he sin before birth or did his parents sin? It was a theological curiosity for them. But I want you to look in verse 1. It says that Jesus saw the man. Jesus saw the man. This man mattered to Jesus. He mattered not because he was a theological curiosity. He mattered because he was a person. He was not an object of pity. He wasn't a nuisance. He was someone that mattered. He was somebody And when you walk across the New Testament and you look at Jesus in his life, what you see is people matter to Jesus. Travis, a few weeks ago, preached about the woman at the well in Samaria. That woman, her brokenness, encountered Jesus. And he met her at that point. He offered compassion, but he also offered her a new story. It might be children who in that day were not anything to be valued, but Jesus valued children. He would take a child and place them on his knee. He would include them. Children mattered. It might be with the mass crowds who were hungry in the wilderness and he made sure their needs were met. It might be a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and she touched just the hem of the garment and she was healed. And what did Jesus do in the midst of that crowd? He turned and he looked and he looked at her. He saw her. He saw the woman caught in adultery. In the midst of her shame and sin, he offered a new story. People matter to Jesus. And if you're with us today and you're watching online or you're here in the sanctuary, I want you to know your story matters to Jesus. He is willing to meet us in our brokenness and our pain, and he's willing to come to us. We'll see that throughout this story. This man mattered. You know, as I prepared for this week, I I thought about a message that our pastor brought from the pulpit back in the fall about living in unity, about reconciling relations with brothers and sisters, racial reconciliation. And in that message, he quoted our former pastor, Dr. Herbert Howard, a message that he preached right here in the sanctuary on a number of occasions, everybody, somebody. 
And I want you to know, as we look at this story today, this man that the disciples saw as an object was somebody to Jesus. He was somebody. He mattered. And my friends, when we think about that, we need to realize people matter to Jesus. Therefore, as his followers, they matter to us. You know, one of the things I love about Park Cities is we love our city. It's not just a series. We love where we live. And for many of us, when we hear kind of this thought of everybody, somebody, what our minds go to is the other areas of the city, the underserved areas of the city, those that are marginalized. And, you know, I believe God would be pleased at that. You see Jesus the first time that he reads the text in the synagogue. What does he do? He takes the scroll, he goes to Isaiah 61, and he identifies in that passage that his ministry is to proclaim the good news to the poor. God has a heart for the poor. But what we need to understand is this. God has a heart for every person. And your life intersects with people every day who have needs. Some that are poor, they're underserved, they're marginalized. Some that come from very privileged backgrounds. But if we are going to love where we live, we need to trust that God will bring people across our ways. Serving isn't something to go on your calendar. It doesn't just go on your calendar. It's not when the church says, we're going to be serving in this area. Now, I'm grateful that we do. I think that blesses this church more than we bless those that we serve. I'm grateful that we do that. But it's every day. How do we begin the series? We pray that God might bring people across our paths. And when we see this man in this story, he was not a nuisance. He was someone that had a need. His presenting need was eyesight. That was his presenting need. But we're going to find it's not his primary need. And God gives him a new story. Now, I want you to think for a moment about your story. You know, I've spoken of my story from this pulpit before, and I've told you, I know I'm not the most exciting guy in this room. All of you would go, that's correct. You're not. In fact, we could move to the Narthex Chapel, four or five of us. I wouldn't be the most exciting one in the four or five. I'm comfortable with that. And I've told you before, I'm more exciting at age 62 than I was at age 18 when I met Jesus. I mean, I was a dull kid. I was the prototypical firstborn. I was a rule follower on steroids. I didn't want to do anything to dishonor my parents. As I was thinking about this, I thought about Senior Skip Day. Even back then, they did Senior Skip Day. I skipped a period. Now, it was the end of the year. I went to the Dairy Queen. There wasn't much to do in our town, and I went to a group of my friends. I still remember just being mortified and guilty. I still kind of blushed when I thought about it just the other day. I was that kid. I was dull. But what I've discovered in Christ is, it's not about me being good and God making me better. That's not it. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not a reformation project just to make me better, to look better. The gospel is about taking someone who is lost and alienated from God and bringing them into relationship. And that was what I needed. Now, as a child, we grew up in a different denominational tradition. I was in Sunday school. My mom loved vacation Bible school. She thought Bible school was so great, she wanted me to see how the other denominations did it. You know, the Presbyterians in my town did a great Bible school. I was there. She taught Bible school in our church. We were there. When I was 12, I was confirmed. And it was there that I began to sense God doing something, but I didn't know what. And here's what you need to know about me. I was really quiet. Probably still am to a degree. And because I was quiet, I didn't take the opportunity to really pursue this and ask questions. I just listened. I went home. Now, in my home, religious education was outsourced to the church much the way that I outsourced my kids' math uh, education to the schools. That was the church's job. Now, what I've come to discover is, is that parents, that is your role. That's your role. If you're here today as a parent, you are the primary disciple maker of your child. Now, it's not to say we don't have a role. We do. We are here to support you and love you and equip you. We are here to provide great experiences for your kids. I told you earlier, Vacation Bible School will be back on campus this year. Best week of the year. But the primary disciple maker of the child is the parent. And my parents kind of outsourced that 
And the problem was we moved right after that. We moved to a town where the first church of our denomination wasn't very welcoming. We joined, but we became Easter Christmas Christians. And what I determined later on was that I had an identification with that denomination, with that church. If you had asked me, are you a Christian? Yes, I go to such and such church. I see it here in Dallas. People have a cultural identification with the church, but they've never met the Lord of that church. And that was me. I had never met all that God had for me. I had never embraced the gospel. I was a cultural Christian. And so my story begins with me really just through high school living a good life. I led a good life. Brings me to the second point, and that is how I met Jesus. How I met Jesus. I want us to go back to the text. Look with me in verse 4. Look with me in verse 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. Now we see in this passage right here that Jesus takes some dirt, he makes mud out of it, and he takes it and he spreads it across the man's eyes. He tells him to go bathe in the pool of Siloam. Now what we see in the text is Jesus and the disciples did not accompany him. They went on their way. So someone else took him. They take him to the pool. And we read in verse 7, as that man went to the pool, he leaned down, he took the water, and he began to bathe his eyes. He began to wash that mud out of his eyes. Why did Jesus choose this way to heal? We don't know. Every story is unique. Every healing for Jesus was unique. But he chose on this day to heal in this way. And as that man began to wash the the dirt from his eyes, all of a sudden he experiences something he's never experienced. He begins to see light begin to filter in. It registers along his optic nerve into his brain, and as he begins to flutter his eyelids open, he begins to see shapes. Certainly he needed to focus his eyes. There's shapes. All of a sudden there's colors. And as he begins to take focus, think about this. He's never seen anything, and he sees the world in which he was born in. Can you imagine the joy? And he received that joy because Jesus took the time to bless him. Jesus took the time. You know, I've heard our pastor say on many occasions, Jesus was always busy, but he was never in a hurry. Always busy, but never in a hurry. On this day, the Lord of life himself took time to care for this man. You know, I thought about that this morning. I was running in here earlier for a sound check, and a dear friend of mine said, I really need to talk to you. Now remember, I'm the rule follower. I wanted to be on time. So I said, can we talk after church? And they said, well, no, I can't. I've got something to do. We'll, we'll get together next week. And I said, you know what? This is more important. Let's talk. And as I was sitting down there just a moment, I thought about this point in the message. On that, in that talk just a few moments ago, Maybe I had the best, greatest blessing of my day. But it took time for me to say, this person matters. For this person, this man, he was somebody and he mattered. And Jesus gives us in this passage almost a a ministry statement, a mission statement. And we all know the term night cometh. You walk out today and you look up to the steeple and you're going to see it on the clock face. Night cometh. And Jesus is reminding us that there's a day coming when we do not have the opportunity to meet the needs. One of these days this heart is going to stop. One of these days the Lord himself is going to come and he's reminding us, take advantage of this day. This day. Today is the day to offer hope. Today is the day to take the time to offer compassion. Today is the day to trust that God is going to allow you to be a part of someone's story being transformed. That's the call for each one of us, to love where we live and to participate with God in the redemption of this area. So I was studying, I read a quote by Archbishop William Temple. 
He said in 1936, it is clear that the church only fulfills its function as the body of Christ if it is constantly thinking of those outside and how they can be inside. The preoccupation of the church should be those outside. Now, we all think when we hear this, of this building, people need to be in this building. Well, I hope so. We got lots of room. And as we begin to open up more and restrictions come down, we have lots of room. But I believe what he's saying here is, it's not about the building. As much as I love this sanctuary, I can remember 26 years ago, the first time I ever walked down this aisle, and how moved I was at the beauty of this room. I loved coming back after six months and worshiping here. But this is not Park City's Baptist Church. You're the church. And what he's saying is that all of us need to be preoccupied, that we need to be thinking about those whose lives come into contact with us, how we might be a part of seeing a new story develop. All of us have a part. That's the role of the church for us to go out, to love our city, and to think about that. Here we are on the northern edge of the park cities. University Park and Preston Hollow could be different. They could be far different places if we as a church love where we live. Think about where you live. I live in Lake Highlands. Lake Highlands can be different. Highland Park can grow. Lakewood, East Dallas, South Dallas, Oak Cliff, go up to North Dallas and to Richardson and Plano. God has a place for all of us where we live to be the presence of Christ. And we can love where we live, and what we'll see is a city can be transformed. But it means that we take the time to live out the story, listen to another story, and see how God might use us. We can bring new life. New life. Now, that's not us that does that. We know that's the Lord. But He can use us to be a part of it. Now, when I read this story... Jesus took that mud and he placed it upon the eyes. Why did he do that? I don't know. But it may have been that that mud served as an irritant. It served as kind of the catalyst for him to go to that pool and to receive the healing, to obey the Lord, and to receive the healing that he had for him. I don't know what the reason was. But if that would be the case, in my life there was an irritant. When I came to faith in Jesus, my irritant was a lack of purpose. Now again, I wasn't off involved in terrible things. That wasn't the issue. But I had an issue of not knowing what I was going to do with my life. And you say, well, God, uh, God doesn't give that to everybody when they're in 12th grade. Well, he doesn't, and I understand that. For me, it, there was a real purpose to it, though. My parents had told me there had been some business reversals, and they didn't, they didn't want to send me off to the schools that I was thinking of because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and they had an idea. We're going to send you to the community college. Right up the road, you can live at home. This is great. Well, it did become great at the time I didn't see it. But again, I'm the rule follower. I understood exactly what the situation was, and so that was my plan. But I knew for me to work my way out of that community college, I needed to know what I was going to do. There wasn't going to be money for a five- or a six-year plan. So I really just, all across my senior year, internally, I processed what I want to do with my life. What am I going to do? Nothing came. I entered into my graduation period. Nothing came. And I'll never forget, at my graduation, baccalaureate was a requirement. So I went to the baccalaureate. I was there with all of my friends. All of my friends were, were believers. All of my friends were actually Baptists. And they lived authentic lives in front of me. So we're there at baccalaureate, and of all things, their pastor is the one selected to bring the baccalaureate message. Now, it was a different day, and in that day, you could say what you wanted. So he brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. He brought the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I heard it. For the first time in my life, I heard it. And then you know what I did? Nothing. Nothing. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know who to process it with. Again, remember, I don't process with people that well, or at least I didn't then. And so I just went home. It kind of went on a shelf. But I'll tell you this, I thought about it all across that summer. All across that summer, I thought about it. All across that summer, I wondered what God might have for me. And I, I thought about it. Now, when I think about this sighted man now, what happened with him? 
The presenting need has been met. We read that he goes home. And when he goes home, there's quite a stir. The neighbors all come out. This guy left this morning. He's blind. Now he comes back and he sighed. What has happened in his life? What's happened? And they begin to question him. Is it you? They take him to the Pharisees. And then there's really a stir because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And so there's this stir with the Pharisees. And you see they parry back and forth, back and forth. It is a comical story. I would encourage you, go home and read this passage in its entirety. But they're back and forth. They call his parents in and they said, is this your son? Yes, he is. Was he blind? Yes, he was born blind. Well, how do you explain this? Well, the Bible tells us they were frightened of the Pharisees. And they said, we don't know. He's of age. Ask him. Ask him. And so they come back to the man and they begin to ask him again and again. There is just this comical point where he says, listen, you're asking me all these questions. Do you want to be his disciples too? And at that point, they've had enough and it tells us that they throw him out. Verse 35. They take him, they throw him out of the synagogue. He is excommunicated. He's excommunicated. In his culture, that was tragic. They've had it. But here is a part that you may have missed. Look with me in verse 35. Verse 35. Jesus heard. Jesus heard. He heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. The man said, Lord, I believe. But I want you to notice, Jesus heard. Jesus hears us at the point of our need and our pain and our brokenness. And not only does he hear, he went out and he found him. He found him. And in my life, Jesus found me. When it came time to go to college, my friends were packing up their car. I was just gassing my car to go 20 minutes up the road. But I also chose to go to that Baptist church. And it was there that pastor stood up and once again, he articulated the gospel. And this time, I did something. I did something. I walked down and I went to what we would call a next steps area here at Park Cities. And I actually talked with someone I processed what I heard, and when I left, I had placed my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I understood that Jesus loved me, that he had come and he had found me, that he was the Son of God, that he had died on the cross for my sin, and that he offered me life and life eternal, and my story changed. Now, my story is far different from that man 2,000 years ago, but we had the same ending. We looked at him and we believed and he worshiped. Now again, I want you to notice there's two verses in here that I think you may have missed in the past. Verse 1, Jesus saw him. He saw him. He was somebody. But in the ending of the passage, verse 35, Jesus went looking for him. Jesus went looking for him. My friends, we can cooperate with the Lord as he seeks to bring others into relationship with himself. We can love our city. We can love our neighbors. We can be a part of the, of the changing of a life story as we share what God has done for me. So quickly, number three, my life since I met Jesus. You know, in this passage, we don't know any more about this man. His story ends in Scripture with him looking and worshiping the Lord. Lord, I believe. Now, certainly for him, there were negative consequences for being thrown out of the synagogue. Certainly there were. But don't you know they were offset by the blessing of his sight of a new life, but also the blessing of purpose and eternity. There were blessings for this man. We don't know what happened to him. I was talking to the pastor this morning, and I said, you know, I like to think he was there on Pentecost Sunday. I'd like to think that someone that that was this uh, just on fire for the Lord, someone that was this gifted and bright became a leader in the early church. One day I may ask him. One day I may ask him. 
We don't know much about his life after he followed Jesus, but here's what I do, and I know what happened to my life. There was power in purpose in life. Power in purpose in life. Like that blind man, I can now say, all I know is this, Jesus changed my life. He changed my life. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians these words, For what we preach is not ourselves. As you tell your story, it's not about you. He said, What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. My friends, as you share your story, remember who the true hero of the story is. is Jesus. And we're called to be servants, to love our neighbors, to love our city, to be a catalyst for change. And so here's my challenge to you as we finish today. I ask that you would go home and you would think through your faith story. You may have never written it down. Write it down. Write it down. See what God has done in your life and give Him gratitude for the hope that you have. Write it down in the three acts that I mentioned to you. Be real. Be yourself. Keep it short and to the point. Practice it. And then share it. Share it. We talked about praying that God might bring people in your life. Be prepared. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We have hope as followers of Jesus. He says, but do this with gentleness and respect. Be prepared. So I encourage all of you, as we prepare for Holy Week, go back, think through your faith story, write it down, and once again, Do as we saw this man do today, just worship the Lord.